we're on the bottom of Memtesam and Aleph, and we're carrying on to the top of Memtes Amid Beis. We're learning in Agadita about marriage and who to marry. And the Gemara established that a person should sell the shirt off his back in order to marry a Bas Talmud Chacham. On a Rabbonon on the top of Memtes Amid Beis, we all am Yimkar Adam Kol Mashi Yeshla V'Yisa Bas Talmud Chacham. And now the Brisa gives us a seder adifut. In other words, if you cannot marry a bas Hamad chacham, what's next on the list? Going down one level, and what's third on the list? Is yisa bas gedolei ador. And Rashi interprets gedolei ador as a reference to tzaddikim, anche maise. These are people who are well known and recognized because of their great mythos. Lomotza bas gedolei ador, yisa bas roshei knesios. They are also considered bali mitos. They also have many of the outstanding attributes and they are dedicated to the community. Lomotza bas roshei knesios, yisa bas gaboi tzdokah. And this is quite interesting that the Gabbai Tzdoka is considered on a very high level because, as Rashi points out, we don't appoint someone as a Gabbai Tzdoka unless we've checked him out. He has a great reputation. He's known to be a very good person, compassionate, and reliable. And what's fascinating is that one level below Gaboit Stoka is Lomotsa Bas Gaboit Stoka. He's a Bas Malande Tinokos. It would sound like the simple, straightforward reading of this price indicates that a, a Gaboit Stoka is on a higher level than a Malame Tinokos, which is very odd because the Gemara very often indicates that a Malame Tinokos is crucial. I mean, it's somebody that keeps the world going, so to speak. So I have a note here, and he writes the following. He says, Mashma mi divrei ha-gemara, shemalosam shal gabay tztoka, gidola mi malosam shal molam de tinokos. We have a great deal of, uh, of respect or esteem for someone who is a tztoka collector, than for someone who teaches the young children. And therefore, it's better to marry, if you have a choice, a Bas Gabbet Stoka, and only if you can't find a Bas Gabbet Stoka, then you marry the daughter of a Malami Tinokos. And he writes Tamua, because Isa the Gemara Baba Basra, the Gemara has a drasha on a posik in Daniel which reads, Hamaskilim Yazhiru Kizor Horakia. Now, who are these maskilim that radiate like the beautiful uh, sunlight and so forth? Elu Gaboy Tzdoka. But then the end of the Pesach says, Umatzike Harabim Kikochavim. The Elu Melande Tinokos. And the impression you get is that the beauty of the stars exceeds the Zohar Harakia. Zohar Harakia is some sort of like flash of light, a brilliant light in the horizon, but the beautiful light that uh, shines from the from the stars, that would that would seem to be even more beautiful, putting Malamde Tinokas on a higher higher level than Gaboit Stoka. The Tosis here, Dibra Maska Lo, which is the second toast on the page, says that Zohar HaRakia is actually greater. It supersedes Zohar HaKochavi. And the Mila of Gaboy Tzoka is greater than the Mila of Malam de Tinokos. And the Ran writes that he found this logic very, very strange for many, many years. I guess he studied astronomy and he came to the conclusion that the beauty of the Zohar Harakia 
exceeds that of the light of the stars. But in any event, this is a very new idea that Gabay stuck on such a high level that supersedes even that of Melande Tinokos, who really keep the world going. In any event, we've got these five levels. There's no sixth level. And the Bryson completely closes the door, don't even consider the possibility of marrying the daughter of an Amoritz. Lo yisa bas ame aoretz mipnei shehem kishekets. They are considered like some dis, something disgusting, like a creeping, a creeping crawling thing. Now it's very interesting because the word shekets is usually designated for avodah zorah. Avodah zorah is called shekets because the Torah says. We're not allowed to get any benefit from Avodah Zorah. So the Marsha comments that the reason why the Gemara borrows this term Sheketz from Avodah Zorah and applies it to Amoritz is to impress upon us that just like we have to stay away from Avodah Zorah and it's Osir Bano, we can't get any benefit from Avodah Zorah, so too we're not allowed to attach ourselves to Amiya Oritz in any way, and certainly not to marry their daughter. And let me just read one more line, and then I want to make a general comment about this Agadito. He says, Unishoseyem Sheretz. In other words, even those who are married to Amiya Oritz, these wives, they're also considered Sheretz. We also assume that they are Nogua, uh, they are they are affected by in the same way as their husbands as an Amoritz. The Albinoseim, and as far as marrying the daughter of an Amoritz, the Torah says, "Oru shochev im kol behem." And okay, the Amoritz doesn't appreciate the significance of Torah. And in that sense, just like an animal can't appreciate the Torah, the Gemara uses this as a mosh. Now, before I came to this meeting, as we call it, I had doubts, I had vacillations, whether or not to learn the Gemara that we're about to learn, the Sagadita, because, you know, the terrible things... You know, you can say all sorts of things about an ignorant person who doesn't know Torah. Maybe we're talking about a person who could have studied Torah and deliberately avoided Torah. But still, we're going to see such very, very extreme, harsh things. I mean, I would never say that Namorat is Chayav Misa, that we should put him to death. <laughs> so I was really going to skip this whole Agatha because I felt it was way beyond my over my head, but I found a footnote here, Dafka in the English translation, which calmed me down a little bit. And he writes the following. If you happen to have the English translation, you'll see his footnote number nine. And he writes, an Amoritz in this context signifies a person who is deliberately evil. In other words, this is a whole different terminology. You know, we have associations with terms that we see in the Gemara and the Shas, and very often we're mistaken. I don't think there's a more profound example than this one. I mean, wake me up in the middle of the night and ask me about Nam Arts, I'll give you a whole list of them. <laughs> I know many of them, but I wouldn't call them, uh, you know, evil people. So that this terminology of Nam Arts has to be seen in a totally different light as it's used in the Talmud than the way we use it. And this person is deliberately evil, not only with respect to God, you know, it's bad enough if, let's say, they're not mafres, trumas, and meisters, but also with respect to man, to fellow man. And specifically, the reference here is to someone who frequently engages in violence and banditry and is suspected of murder. On both sides, this is not an Amoritz in our dictionary. We've got to create a whole new lexicon. 
this is a murderer, or at least a sus- someone who's suspect of murder. You know, I would add, you know, to this footnote that we're talking about a rodev. A rodev has to be put to death. He says, in view of his evil ways, it may be necessary to kill him when the opportunity arises to save the lives of future victims. He's mamish talking about a rodev. He doesn't use that term, but and he quotes Tosis, he quotes the Rush. He says that others, and here I think he quotes the Ritva and the Ran, understand that Agamar is referring to someone who at this very moment has the intention to sexually humiliate, humiliate another person, and it's going to be either a male or a female. The law in such a case is that one should kill the pursuer, oh, now he's talking about a road, Dave, in order to save the intended victim, and he tells you to look in Sanhedrin of Ayn Gimel. In fact, this law is not limited to an Amor Aretz. We're talking here about an Amor Aretz that's behaving like a road. Now, you might ask, so why doesn't the Gemara use the word road? I mean, why beat around the bush? You know, why mislead me and use the term Amaretz. And here I would say there's an agenda. You know, Chazal want to tell you that the root of all these issues of a person who's evil and he tries to sexually attack someone else or he engages in violence, what is the root of evil? It's Amar Amaretz. It's the fact that he does not expose himself. He's not interested in studying Torah. And then, and this last paragraph, in the name of the Ritva, really saved the day for me. He says, some Rishonah maintain that the Gemara should not be taken literally, which always reminds me of what I heard from the Rav, that we don't have the keys to understand the God of it. It is certainly forbidden to kill an Amaretz. One who kills an Amaretz is subject to the death penalty. Rather, the Gemara is using an exaggerated statement in order to encourage people to leave the ignorant ways of Amir Aretz and study Torah. And he quotes the Maral, who says that the Gemara is not to be taken literally, so we have none other than the Ritzvah and the Maral to rely on. And, and in a sense, that gave me the sort of license to go ahead and, and, and to teach this Agatha, although, as I said, I was very tempted to skip the whole business. And again, keep in mind, we're talking not about an Amor Aretz the way we call an Amor Aretz, but we're talking about a person who is vicious, he is a bandit, he is evil to both God and to man, he's suspect of the most horrible sexual crimes and even murder, and according to some, he's actually in the pursuit of his victim, and therefore we're going to put him to death. Tanya Rebbe Omer, Ama Oretz, Asur Lechol, Basar, some have the gears of Basar Behema. He should not be allowed to eat meat. Shenemar, Zos Torah Sabehema Va'of. And then the word Torah here is to be taken as a reference to the study of Torah. The Torah goes on to say that we're allowed to eat behem and oaf, but it's only Torahs. If we have Now here I have a note in the name of the Ramban. He says, He says, as a result of their ignorance, they don't know the laws of Shechita, of Melicha. And the, the Ramban is medayik that the name Dogim here does not appear on the page because Dogim don't require Shechita. He quotes the Marsha that the difference between Basar Behema and Of on the one side and Dogim on the other is that with regard to Behemoth of Rabu Dinehem? There are so many Dinim 
that apply to behem of the He will not be able to be careful about the laws and the permission to eat basar, behema, and oak. Ach dogim, efshal avchid bekalut, v'snapir, because kesa is to show me a, a fish, I'll tell you whether it's kosher or not, and therefore mutal achal, adam li ocham, even in Amor, it's allowed to eat fish. He quotes the Be'iri, she din ze nemar dafka b'mokom she ein gadol mimenu ima. If he's together with a a great person who's a supervisor who knows the law, then that's okay. Now, Sveikos, Hamizdamnos, Bitschrita, Bitschrefos, Bimalicha, Bitaroves, who are the Yodel Achriyabayan? He himself, the Amorites, cannot decide any of these halachas. Ach, however, if ye are Gadolimo, ye are Mutal Olecho, because he will rely on the Kashra supervision of the God. The Ben Yoda says we should not take this Gemara to mean that it, there's an Isur, that an Amaretz is really not allowed to eat. He says, even if we have kosher meat, we should prevent him from eating the meat. The Kavon Shem Yurgal Be'achilas Bosar, he says, you know, this is kosher meat, but if he gets used to eating meat, then even if he finds himself in a place where there's no kosher meat, lo tavaso, he will not be able to overcome his desire for meat, and therefore yochal basa trefa, he will eat non-kosher meat. The most philosophical of all approaches here is that of the Ein Elio. In the name of the Mepharshim, this is almost an address to uh, vegetarians. What, what allows man to take the flesh of an animal and eat it? He uses his freedom of choice to study, to understand, to contemplate, and to fulfill the will of God. And therefore, but if he's a person, she'eno osa rotsan Hashem, harehu hagarua mikol balechayim, he's even worse than the animals. The animals don't have that uh, intellectual capacity. The elo rishus lishlot aleim uliach. So it's interesting. Every time you eat a piece of meat, you should have this kavana that you are chosen as a balsechel, as someone who fulfills the rotsan of Hashem. This is the idea that we mentioned before. He's a rodef and we can put him to death. And we can give him a violent sort of death. The translation of which is here based on Rashi elsewhere, Rashi and Chulin, is meaning rip him apart, rip him to shreds. Again, as we said, according to the Ritva, and the Maral, we're not going to take this literally. Now, imagine the necessity, the urgency to put this Amaretz to death. How urgent is it? You have an overlap of the greatest two Kedushos in one day, 24 hours. It's both Shabbos and Yom Kippur. Even so, we're going to rip him to shreds. And again, this would support those Mepharshim who say that we're talking about a Rodev, and he's actually a Rodev right this moment. Postus, on the other hand, Dibar Maskel Yesh, Postus says that we're talking about an Amoritz, Shemakir, <clears throat> it's not a total ignoramus who never was taught, he knows, but Kofir, nevertheless he denies it, and he's Lahachis. Therefore, mutal hargo mishum pikuach nefesh areu listim koshen al adamim. We suspect that he is going to be a murderer. It's almost like the Gemara ben Sora Morer need not al shame sofo or above a teres. You know, you kill him because otherwise he's going to kill you if you try to defend yourself. 
he quotes Rav Shri Ragon, and Rav Shri Ragon is quoted by the Ramban, not here, but elsewhere in Masech HaGiga, Shekavonas HaGvar Lomar, Shepa'omim, Buroso Goremes Lo Lovely De Misa Minuveles, Biyom HaKippurim, Shechal B'Shabes, Vahainu, Shemachmas, Shuama Oretz, Areu Yovo, Lorutz, Achara Zohor, Viachanara Murosa, Yom Kippur, Chalios, Bishabas, Yom de Misa, Minuveles, Bishum, Shem Yamtinu, La Misa, Bishar, Haruge, Kishar, Haruge, Bezdin, Shaborum, La Misa, Yofa, but no, Mimarim, La Misa, Bimisa, Minuveles. In other words, have no compassion whatsoever. You must urgently put him to death because he's running after a male or after a married woman. And again, he quotes many, many Rishonim who assume that this statement of Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lazar is referring to a road. Amr lo Talmida, Rebbe Amar Shoto. Why do you use the term linocharo? Wouldn't it be more appropriate or exact to use the word lishochto? Now, the reason why the Gemara thinks the word lishochto is more appropriate here, says the Chassam Sofer, is based on a Gemara that we didn't get to at the end of this Amu, Shama Oretz Domela Ri, Fedores vi Ochel, vi Eno Mamtin Ad Shetarfo Yomus. He says that the Gemara is going to compare an Amu Oretz to a lion. A lion will pounce upon its prey and start eating it even before the victim, its victim is dead. And therefore, Roy La Hargo be also Derek. Lachain Amrulo Talmido, and Mar Lishoto, Mishum, Shemeshkita, Biad Shoke, Shne Simonim, Nechshav Kemes Avopi, Shemefarches, Viodenu Cha. He says that Shkita would be a more appropriate way of putting this guy to death based on the analogy between an Amoretz and an Ari. Because even after the shechita, the person is still mefarches. He's still sort of like alive, although he's considered he's considered dead. Now he quotes the Marsha, as we saw before, that the Kavanah Sagamara Lomar, Shemutal Avaisho, that this word, L'Shachto, should not be taken literally, but rather it means to embarrass him. Okay, so this Marsha is based on a Gemara in Bab Metziah. The Gemara Bab Metziah says that if you humiliate some, someone, it's as if you were Shofech Domim because he, his face turns red. And that complexion is a reflection of the fact that his his blood is sort of uh, not circulating in the proper way. And according to Marsha, this discussion here about what we should do to the Amoritz is really symbolic of being Mavayashim. And any, any sort of blood here is about embarrassing a person. And he says that... Um, the word shechita is more appropriate here. The shechita yeshbo yoser netilas dam. That through shechita the blood comes flying, you know, flowing out. Amar lehem. So Rebbe Lazar now tells him the Talmidim why he used the word lenochero rather than l'shochto. That shechita requires a bracha, ala shechita, but nechira doesn't require bracha. So I used deliberately the term nechira 
which means it's even more humiliating than the word shechita, because shechita at least is a ritual act and you make a brach on it, but the chira doesn't even get a brach. Once again, Rabosa, I think all this is metaphoric. There's this there's a conversation here that's going that's going on on a deeper level, you know, not on the surface level. Let me just see for a moment in case he adds anything here. Number twelve. Oh, first of all, he has the Masha that we had here in the Masifta that the Gemara used the term stabbing as a metaphor for embarrassing. When one stabs a person, blood flows from him. Similarly, when one embarrasses another person, the blood drains from his face. The Gemara thus means that it's permissible under certain circumstances to embarrass an Amoritz. Fine. Shkita draws even more blood, so let's recommend slaughtering him. He says, we recite a blessing before slaughtering an animal because animals fulfill the purpose for which they were created. And Amoritz, however, does not fulfill the purpose of man, which is the study of Torah. Thus, by mentioning the act of stabbing, which does not warrant a blessing, even in the case of an animal. Rabbi Lazar alludes to the lack of meaning in an Amoritz's life. But let me get that again, that in the case of a of a bracha, so we're saying about the animal that's fulfilling the purpose. And in the case of an Amoretz, we're talking about a person who does not achieve his purpose. And therefore, by mentioning the act of stabbing, Rabbi Lazar alludes to the lack of meaning in his life. Ah, I see. In other words, in Shechita, we indicate that the animal is, so to speak, fulfilling something meaningful for which God created it. It's a fulfillment to the will of God. However, in this case of the Amoritz, we want to say just the opposite, that he does not fulfill the will of God, and therefore we're going to use Nechira as opposed to Shechita. In the case of Shechita, we make a bracha because it indicates that we're, in a sense, elevating the animal to a higher level because it's fulfilling the will of God. Om Rabbi Lozer, Ama Oretz, Osur Lehislavos Imo Bederech. It means that you have to be very, very careful and not place yourself, expose yourself to danger. If you're going to be alone, with this Amar Oretz, who, as we said before, might be suspect of murder, you're putting your life into danger. With regard to Limit Torah, it says, Ki hi vi orech yomecha. We have Ki hu chayecha vi orech yomecha. The Torah is the key to long life. To longevity, right? Al chayav Now he says, "What about this Amaretz? Al chayav lochas. He gave up the purpose of life, namely limud Torah. Is al chay chaver lokolshkein? You can bet your bottom dollar that he's not interested in saving your life. In fact, he might even murder you." He says, Tzorch Iu. He quotes the Svas Emes. Amoretz eno chas al chayov hu bamesh eno lomei Torah. Vim kein hoyelo gak lachso shi monu mi lilmo. Maybe this Amoretz is going to prevent you from studying Torah. Madua choshesh, why should we suspect she are geu hu bira Svas Emes shaho viniach Amoretz es divrei ha Torah velo chas al chayav in other words, all he's interested in is some sort of selfish pleasure, but he's not really having any compassion on his own life. Is Yeshach Shosh? We therefore suspect Shematis Gaberol of Taiva, Larugas Chavero, Velo Yimona Mizeh. I find this interesting that the Sfasemis used the word Taiva 
to describe murder. You know, I would have said that taiva has to do with lust, with eating, gluttony. We spoke before yesterday about it. Uh, even the Tabun Chacham would get so caught up and swept away by gluttonous eating. But he's using the word taiva for a person's desire to murder. I guess there are people who are murderers and they just get so much pleasure out of, out of murdering. And again, it's, it's something that's so far into our, to our understanding. So if this person is not able to overcome his taiva and he leaves the Torah behind, then we have to worry that he might he might kill he might kill you. Again, but here he's not telling you to put him to death. We're not talking necessarily about a road. We're just talking about being marking yourself from the Amorites because you might be exposing yourself to danger. We can rip him apart like we do to a fish. Migabo is always used in the Gemara to refer to a maka she'en la refua. She'en lichios yoser. He'll die from this maka. Now, comes along the Me'iri, and he says that we should understand this Gemara in light of the Gemara in Sota, where the Gemara has a ver- various opinions about the Amor Oretz. And he says, Khan, here in our Gemara, we're talking about someone who was exposed to Torah, and he was kofar, he rejected the Torah, and he's interested lahachnis, lahachis. You know, he's just a deliberate, you know, sinner rebelling against God. Shari gaso he kamo pikuach nefesh mishum shu listim. We're talking about someone who's abandoned bechashet al ariga, and we suspect that he'll even murder you. And this is the way the Meiri learns our Gemara. Now, the Marsha seems to understand that this Gemara is addressing uh, this more about, you know, staying away from an Amoris because of his uh, danger, the possibility, is specifically addressing Halmidi Chacham. Why? He says, the Gemara is going to explain later on, very shortly, that the hatred of an Amaretz for Talmud Chacham is greater than the hatred of a non-Jew for a Jew. Anti-Semitism reaches one level, but anti talmud Chachamim, in the case of an Amaretz, reaches an even higher level than anti-Semitism. And... Therefore, we have to be very, very worried about our contact with such a person. Now Rabbi Akiva reminds himself of his youth. He studied Torah, began at the age of 40. Amarti, I declared, I declared, I will bite him like a donkey. Amrulo Talmidov, wait a minute, when we talk about an animal that bites, usually we talk about a dog. Is Rebbe Amar Kekelev? Why Why did you say Kechamar? Amar Lehem, Rebbe Akiva says, the reason I wrote, I, I said bite him like a, like a donkey is because Zeh, in the case of a donkey, no sheikh, Vishover etzem. Vizeh, but in the case of a Kelev, Noshech, the Eno, Shover, etzem. So a Chamor, if he's after you, his bite is that much more treacherous than the bite of a dog. 
he writes in the footnote in the name of the Marsha, Ein derech linshoch mamish ule shaber at somos kavanoso shayu misragis olav laharalo. Again, he interprets this Gemara metaphorically. Shekein derech hamisrages hamisrages al chavero lachrok shinov zu bezu. Uh, this idea of biting someone is symbolic of an anger and a hatred of a person. Again, let's just see if he adds anything to this. He says, for the sake, forsaking the study of Torah, which sustains life, the Amor shows that he's reckless even with his own wealth or welfare. Therefore, he certainly has no concern for the welfare of others and might even kill others. The Gemara specifies traveling with an Amoritz, presumably because a journey through uninhabited areas affords him with opportunities for committing murder. He says that if it's absolutely urgent to kill the Amoritz immediately, like we explained before in one of the earlier notes that we read that he is a Rodev, Therefore, we must use whatever method is needed for this purpose, regardless of how repulsive it is. And this is in contrast to the way we execute someone who, in court who is co- condemned to die because of a capital crime. We use the least pa- painful and the least humiliating manner. He quotes the Gemara Ksuba, Samach Beis, Rabbi Kibos, and Amaris until the age of 40. He says, Rabbi Kiva, about himself, he wanted to bite through their bones. The Marsha says this is a metaphor for doing harm to someone. The Gemara and Ksubis that we mentioned earlier mentions that Rabbi Akiva possessed a fine character even before he became learned. He hated Torah scholars only because he thought that they had acted arrogantly towards Amea Oretz. A lion devours its prey while it's still alive. It doesn't wait until it dies. So too an Amea Oretz does not wait until his wife is appeased and willing to engage in marital relations. Rather, he takes her forcefully. Wow. Anya, we learned in a brace. If a person marries off his daughter to an Amoritz, this was the Gemara that we mentioned before that compares the Amoritz to the lion. A lion attacks its prey, eats up its prey even before the death of its prey. The Ainlo Boshes Ponim, he's not embarrassed about that. Afama Oretz, Make Uboel, the Ainlo Boshes Ponim. He will physically harm his wife, and basically he's raping his wife. He doesn't try to pacify her in any way, he has no embarrassment about it. And now you're going to marry your daughter off to such a man. Tanya, we learned in the Bryce Rabbi Lezomer. If not for the fact that we need to buy their wares, their goods, that they're selling, their food, is they wouldn't be gaining anything by us and they would kill us. The only reason they don't kill us is because they need our they need our business. Honor Rabbi Chia Kala Osik Vitor Lufne Amo Arts Kilu Bol Arusasa Bifano. So, what's so terrible about studying Torah in the presence of an Amo Arts? Why is it like Bol Arusasa, which is absolutely forbidden? Bifano. The Nemar Torah Tsiva Lot of Moshe Mo Russia. 
the Torah is considered as compared to being a morosa for Kehilas Yaakov. What exactly is Rabbi Chia's point over here? Oseg Betora Lifneyama Oretz. See if he adds anything. Really difficult piece here. It says anyone who engages in Torah study before an Amor Oretz, it's as if he cohabits with the betrothed wife of the Amorites before him, but thereby he embarrasses him. All right? So he's embarrassing the Amorites. And Nemar, Torah Tzibol on Moshe, Morosha, I'll take you Morosha, Morosha. 24, the verse that teaches that the Torah is the betrothed of all congregants of Yaakov, even the Amel Arts. The Marsha explains that the Torah became Israel's betrothed at Sinai. Like a betrothed wife, the Torah was merely designated for the Jews at that time. Their relationship was not consummated until they studied the Torah. Thus, to an Amel Arts who has not studied Torah, the Torah is still analogous to a betrothed wife. The Gemara continues with this Brisa Gdola, Sina Shesonim Ama Arts of Tamiri Chachamim Yoser, Misina Shesonim Uma Saolam Es Yisrael. That hatred is even more intense than the hatred of the enemies of Israel. When it shall say, I'm Yoser Mehem, and their wives hate Torah scholars even more than they do. And Amor Arts is consumed with a jealousy of Torah scholars. He recognizes their superior attributes, feels that he is worthless in comparison. This jealousy burns even more fier- fiercely in the hearts of their wives. Okay, so this reduces the hatred of the Amor Arts to jealousy. That's one possible perspective. He says here, Hakavoda Yishe Im Sone Amorts is Talmidi Chachoma Rezu Sino Ashigdola Yosem Isinas Nochrim the Israel Ach Yesh Ame Orts She Enom Sonim Talmidi Chachom. Again, you know, the Gemara is, is sort of generalizing, but it really depends how it fits the individual case. And he says, Ame Orts Oskim Bimolachtom. Okay, he's offering the following suggestion that the Amorites himself, in order to make a living, he travels and he's far away from his home. His wife, on the other hand, is at home She's not far from Talmidei Chachamim, or at least there are wives that live in the same area. These are wives of Talmidei Chachamim. The roos, she'enon mashilos lehen kelim, u'misrachakos mehen yeshahoyu shomros tahara. Oh, wow. This is a whole nother perspective here on the wives of the Amioritz. And the Rechuk here is because the Eishas Talmud Chacham is very careful about Tuba Vitara. So she doesn't want to lend her Kalim to the Eishas Amorit because she wants to make sure it remains Tar. Now he adds another addition here, which is metaphysical. He says, Nishmasa Roa she realizes that the Ashes Tamil Chacham will get a uh, a half of the of the schar of, of their husbands. The Afshiba Ulama Zerala, 
even though they're not doing well in this world. And then he writes that Amo Arts Maka Osa Uba Levenu Mavral Mitosa Vinu Tamid Chacham Mechabed Amo Chach Mechabed is Ishto Mavral Mitosa. So the close proximity between the wife of the Amoritz and the wife of the Talmud Chacham leads to a state of jealousy because she's always comparing her relationship with her husband to that of her neighbor who's married to a Talmud Chacham. L'chein, machmas kinezu, ha'orer eishas ha'moritz sino gedola yosemi bala. He doesn't have that burning jealousy that she has because he's out there far away from the Talmud Chachamim and so forth. Anya, Shona uperesh Yosem Mikula. A person who studied Torah and then he leaves Torah, he knows many Talmidic Chachamim, and he writes here, Yodea Kama Talmidic Chacham Meganim is Amars. He realizes and appreciates. How bad is the resentment of Talmud Chachamim or the Ginu, the Gnai that Talmud Chachamim feel towards the Amorites? So come Shvelim Ebeinim, realizing that they are low in the eyes of the Talmud Chacham. Is in Asal the Talmud Chacham Gdol Yosem Mikula. It even exceeds beyond the hatred of the enemies of the Jews. So this actually, this brisa seems to touch on the idea of jealousy. And the Amoris feels very low in comparison to the Talmud Chach. He suffers from that like inferior uh, inferiority complex. It says, One who has learned Torah and then departed from its ways hates Torah scholars more than any of them do because he is aware of the low regard that the Torah scholars have for the Amel arts. In other words, he, he knows from the inside because he was once studying Torah that how much the Talmud Chachamim you know, looked down upon the Amel arts. And that generates his sinna when he... Uh, when he thinks about the the uh, low view that the Talmudic Chacham have of people like him, there are six laws that apply to an Amaritz. Ain Moshem Lem Edus. We do not invite them, subpoena them, to listen to their testimony. In other words, we don't trust that testimony. He writes in the footnote here, Ein mitzarfen also im od shnai machim k'dei l'kabal edus. The af she'ein echad motzui lach to b'fnei shnai em ikom akom ho'il v'ein yochel l'hoid ein yochel l'kabal edus. In other words, let's say we have two people who are sitting in a court and they want to receive the witnesses and allow the witnesses to testify, we should not add the Amal Arts as the third member of this tribunal. And the reason is because anyone who cannot be relied on to testify cannot be relied on to accept testimony. Ein makabli menu edus. And here he quotes the Me'iri who says, Mipneshu choshud ala shvua v'ala gezel. The Ein Megalam Lem Sod, we shouldn't reveal to them any secrets because they are Cholche Rachil Umegalim Larabim is Mashiod. They like to blab, blabber out loud and publicize whatever, whatever, you know, exciting, juicy news they find out about, some secret. Ein Memanin Osan Apitropus Ali Yisom. Right, if a young fellow was orphaned, never. Then we have to appoint an apitropis who is a pikeach that oversees all the financial needs and the expenses and also the profits that go in and out of the bank account to these somim. That's the apitropis. But 
in the case of an Amoretz, then we will not appoint an Apotropos. Why? In other words, the Apotropos is naive in a sense that if he thinks that he's representing someone who is honest, in the case of an Amoretz, he's Choshet al gezel al and therefore, ain mimanen o son apitropis. We cannot ap- appoint an ama oretz as an apitropis. Al kupa shal tzdaka to oversee the communal chest. The ain mislavin imoyim bederech. As we said earlier, we're afraid that he might kill you if you go along with him on the road. The yesh omrim. Others say af ain machrizin al We have no mitzvah regarding the Amoretz and monetary possession. And therefore, reason so this is based on a pasuk, and that's only a chicha, sha'osa, ma'isa, imach, but not an Amoretz. And therefore, he's not included in this Halacha of Vachain Tase, which is the source for Akroza. He's not considered Bechlal Achicha in the Pasuk Kain Tase, Lachalavedas Achicha. Now, it seems that regarding this last law, there was a Machlokas because the Yesh Omrim is going beyond the Shisha Dvar. So it means there was a Tanakama, and he listed six laws with regard to the Amoritz. And the Yesh Omrim added another law, that Ein Machrizen al Avidosa. So the Gemara asks now the question, apparently the Tanakhama held that, yes, we will be Machriz Avedas Amoritz. And the question is, why? The Tanakhama, Zimnin denofek minei zara mi al yavi shenemar, Yochin Vitzadik Yilbosh. We have to take into consideration the possibility that this Amoretz will have children that are Ksherim, that are good guys, and they will receive their Nechassim, meaning they will inherit the Nechassim from their father who's an Amoretz. And therefore, financially, we have an obligation vis a vis the Amoretz. In order to, in effect, in effect, it's our obligation towards the children of the Amor. Shenemar Yochin v'Tzadik Yil Bosh, a Rosha Yochin B'Gado, but Lubasof Tzadik Yil Bashem. So we should be machris on their Aveda because it's possible that ultimately whatever you return to the Amor will be bequeathed to his children. Who are sharing. So that's really interesting that this is the last line in our Agadita, that the Gemara in a sense ends this Agadita on a on a on an upper note, so to speak, on a more positive note. That we, according to Tanakam, at least, we will return a lost object to an Ama Aretz. And that comes under this Posikani of Yochin with Sadik Yilbosh. He, the wicked man, prepares a wardrobe, but a righteous man will wear it, and that righteous man will wear it as a reference to the children. And we suspect, or we hope, that the children of the Amoretz will return, you know, to the to the proper path. Okay, that's the end of the Agadita, and I'm going to uh, stop now. We, now we're about to begin this whole sugya about kodshim che nifsalu, and if you're on the road and you forgot that you have these kodshim, you have to burn them, and you have to go back to your chalayim, back to the bira. Okay, we'll leave that for Yom Rishon and Mirza Hashem. Okay, then? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.